Welcome and greetings. My name is Eric Miller. I'm the Regional Director for the Export-Import Bank of the United States, and I'm proud and pleased to be your moderator today. Our topic is Hear From Your Peers, and we have three very accomplished small business exporters who will discuss the successes and challenges of exporting. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. This session will be recorded. And if you have any questions, I encourage you to put them in the chat window at any time during the presentation and we will address those individually at the end. So a quick introduction of our panelists. We have Dr. Wei Shen Lai, who's a co-founder and CEO of Acoustic Sheep out of Pennsylvania. We have Mr. Greg Tadlock, who's the Executive Vice President of Sales with the Software Revolution out of Washington. And Mr. Neil Asbury, who's the President of Greenfield World Trade out of Florida. Welcome panelists. Thank you. Well, all three of these companies are very different. I would like to point out that they all do share in one thing and that they were the exporters of the year award recipients from XM Bank last year. So just wanted to point that out and extend our congratulations once again for that outstanding achievement. Congratulations. Thank all right. You. So as a means of starting, I would like uh, the panelists just to give a brief introduction of themselves and, and their company, just two to three minutes, starting with Dr. Lai, then going to Greg and then to Neil. Dr. Lai. Thank you, Eric. My name is Dr. Wei Shen Lai, and I am the CEO of Acoustic Sheep. Um, back in 2007, my husband and I, uh, we actually started the company ourselves and bootstrapped everything until this day. Um, I was working as a family doctor, and late at night, I would get patient phone calls uh, asking me questions and things like that, and then it would be hard for me to get back to sleep. And so I wanted to listen to some relaxing music and my husband found some great stuff for me to listen to, but earbuds are, you know, really poking in my ears and uh, headphones are bulky and I can't turn and sleep on my side whenever, you know, I wanted to listen to the music. So we came up with the idea of putting very thin speakers uh, inside a, of a soft and stretchy headband and we named it Sleep Phones. And um, I tried it, I wore it, uh, it stayed on all night. I was able to get back to sleep. So um, it really made sense to me. And I knew how many of my patients were struggling to sleep uh, and asking for sleep medicines and things like that. And so um, we started the company uh, and about five years in, um, we were still you know, just kind of making it ourselves, uh, working with people we knew. Um, five years in, we made a million dollars in sales. And that's when it dawned on us that, you know, we really should take this to the next level. We get in so many thankful uh, testimonials from customers. So we went to our first trade show and uh, there we saw all these people wanting to buy from us from overseas. We didn't really know what we were doing. We were a little bit overwhelmed. Um, but, you know, we figured out that, okay, if, if we worked with our advisors uh, and, and tried this, we could really grow this company. And so it was at that point that we quit our day jobs and focused full time on growing sleep phones um, and kind of took it to the next level. And at this point, we're at over 20 employees. Um, we work with over two dozen uh, distributors from all over the world. We've shipped to over hundred countries all over the world uh, directly and uh, on every continent, including Antarctica, in fact. Um, and, uh, and we've been working with Exim for the past three years. Excellent, fascinating story. Thank you, Dr. Lai, for sharing. Greg, um, would you mind giving us an introduction? Sure, yeah, you bet. Hey, my name's Greg Tadlock. It's nice to meet you folks. I'm the Executive Vice President of uh, the Software Revolution, known as TSRI in the industry. And um, our company focuses primarily on um, artificial, artificial intelligence-based software modeling and, and uh, software transformation from one development language to another development language. Um, TSRI is not a, a new company, although we're a small company. We were uh, um, basically, um, our, our, we were created under the wing of, of the Boeing Corporation. Um, I, myself and my partner 25 years ago were working for Boeing and created um, a, uh, this artificial intelligence-based software modeling tool that we, after that, moved out and started using uh, in contract to Boeing and other companies 
to transform um, legacy applications on mainframes that are written in old languages like COBOL and Fortran and many of the other 500 legacy languages into modern languages like C++ and Java, uh, you know, Python, uh, Rust, the most modern languages that are being used on, in computing systems today. Um, the process is 100% automatic. We transform an application uh, with 100% uh, uh, efficiency as well. So it's a very, very inexpensive process that used to be very, very expensive. Uh, my history, I was a United States Marine Corps aviator prior to coming to work for Boeing. And um, I saw this to be a, a very big use to the United States Department of Defense uh, when we first started uh, uh, the job. And my job was to open up the market and find ways to help the company grow. Uh, I quickly realized that any company or any large organization that was that was working with a mainframe application, that this was something that was of interest and value to them. Um, our, our first uh, foray into the, uh, into the export market was in Canada, where the Canadian forces was asking us to do the same thing we were doing for things like the ballistic mil or missile early warning system and, and the likes. And, um, and, and then, um, you know, we started getting European aviation agencies and, and now across the entire world. Um, delivering this uh, automated software modernization services to, uh, to the world. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. Software modernization, artificial intelligence, those are certainly buzzwords that I hear more of these days. So thank you for sharing yes. this. Neil? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Neil Asbury. I'm the uh, founder and the uh, owner and president of Greenfield World Trade, also known as the Legacy Companies. We're manufacturers of kitchen appliances and gadgets we sell throughout the, the world uh, to both the consumer industry as well as the commercial industry. Uh, you may have some of our products at your home. Uh, Omega juicers and blenders were the number one producer uh, in the United States. Uh, we own Excalibur food dehydrators, uh, which incidentally is made in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, we oh, own, yes, no. yes, it is right, right down oh, the street from you. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, we own a manufacturing facility there. And um, we own uh, Chef Choice, which is also in Pennsylvania, but the other side in Avondale, we're the world's largest manufacturer of, uh, of knife sharpers. And uh, we do our own diamond plating. And uh, we own West Bend, one of the oldest uh, brands uh, of electric appliances in the United States. We own Venturi which is the wine accessories. So if any people drink wine out there, you may have a Venturi uh, aerator. Uh, one of our greatest hits lately is actually Romanus, it's a healthy dessert maker. Number one dessert maker on Amazon. Uh, and uh, we've had recently 50 million views on TikTok. We had a couple of young girls get a hold of it and all of a sudden it's gone viral. Wow. Um, we also um, have a, a compact major appliance division called Avanti. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a small, compact, major appliances sold primarily to in cities where, where living spaces are smaller. And we also own a number of commercial food service brands uh, that sells in hotels and restaurants around the world. Um, the beginning of our company, the genesis of our company, was after I graduated the university, I got my dream job in Southeast Asia in Singapore, and uh, I was on my way uh, to, to Asia. I was the sales manager of a, of a large British trading firm. I became their sales manager of selling commercial kitchens to the large hotels, resorts, uh, and institutions that were really growing very radically and, and very, very beautifully throughout the Asia Pacific and, and the Middle East. And that's kind of where I cut my teeth, where actually Greenfield World Trade started was about seven years later I had an opportunity to start my own company and I started a manufacturing uh, company in the Philippines that made commercial food service equipment, prim uh, primarily selling to the fast food restaurants. Uh, we got the contract to exclusively build all of the McDonald's restaurants throughout Asia and the Middle East. We built the first 1000 McDonald's restaurants in China as an wow. example, but we handled a lot of other countries as well. And uh, it was an incredible run. I was in my early 30s. The Philippines was going through a people power revolution. Uh, despite the revolution, our little company grew very, very uh, great, a very large company. I ended up selling that division to a, to a uh, public company in Chicago. I moved back home to the United States 
And then over the last uh, uh, 12 years or so, I acquired 15 businesses which now make up the, um, the length companies or Greenfield Trade, um, which now export to more than 80 countries around the world. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Neil. Uh, my takeaway is you are a very, very busy person. Um, <laughs> So, Neil, I got a question for you. Let's open it up to the, 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 the panelists' questions. We live in the biggest economy in the world, number one by GDP. Why would anyone even care to look outside the borders when we have such a, a great amount of uh, economic activity and buyers here in our homeland? Well, it's kind of interesting, you know, because I... I'm one of these people, uh, kind of unique, that I, I became successful overseas and then I came back home uh, to try to duplicate what I was able to do overseas. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, the export market, think about the numbers. I mean, just look at the numbers. 75% um, of the world's wealth is outside the United States. 95% of the world's population is outside the United States. Mm. So why would you not want to plug into that? And as a guy who does a lot of M&A work, you know, being a global business is much better than being a, just a domestic business. I mean, you're creating so much more value in your business. You know, if you have a plan to one day exit your business and sell your business, having a strong international footprint is absolutely essential. I mean, people are looking for that growth. And I got to tell you, over my many years in this in this business of being an American manufacturer, selling around the world, selling domestically, selling internationally, there's been many years where the domestic market really struggled. And I was saved by the international market to help fill in to when the domestic market, uh, you know, wasn't getting it done for us. So it's not just incremental business. This is really fundamental to our success. Very good points. Uh, Greg, anything to add? Yeah, I would say that, um, that you know, from TSRI, it was a very unique situation in that, um, you know, we were clearly focused on the large mainframe modernization business in the United States. When I got started 25 years ago with this idea, uh, right out of the uh, Y2K work that we were doing, um, th there was no uh, concept of a software modernization as a service or uh, software modernization as, as an industry didn't exist. As a matter of fact, uh, I mean, I, I sometimes like to say I created the industry because there was nobody interested in doing this. There were some people that tried and failed and then gave up. Um, and, uh, and today there's you know, a, a, a multi-billion, multi, probably close to a trillion dollar industry and people trying to modernize their software applications using our services and, and now competing services. But uh, uh, as far as the question about, um, you know, why in the United States, why, why move out of the United States, um, that, that came very naturally in that as people around the world started getting uh, uh, news of what was being done here in the United States to help save the you know, the millions and billions of dollars of software maintenance uh, by moving on to new software, um, people from all branches of the, uh, of, of the world started contacting TSRI looking for that service. And so we just naturally had to figure out a way to, to provide that to, to them. And believe me, we've learned through the School of Hard, hard Knocks along the way um, that it can be very dangerous and Export Import Bank has helped us uh, eliminate some of that danger in the process, especially financial danger. Excellent, thank you, Greg. Dr. Lai, anything to add on the why of exporting? Because I know a lot of attendees in the audience are thinking about exporting, uh, maybe they're successful domestically and they just haven't really thought about, you know, why should I export when I'm successful here, why? So, you know, everybody sleeps around the world. Uh, and about a third of us don't sleep well. Um, and so really this is a need that's global. Um, and we came up with a concept. It, it is very new and unique. And uh, headphones uh, admittedly are not the highest tech kind of product out there. So it is um, somewhat easy to copy. Um, and while we do have some copycats out there, um, that's not something that we want to encourage. And uh, so for us, uh, you know, in addition to everything 
that everybody else has said. Uh, it's also a defensive move on our part to make sure that we're in the country first, that we have presence in those countries, that our trademarks are in there, uh, that you know we establish that we are the number one, the best, and you know the go-to brand, um, and everybody else is just an imitator. All really good points. So I'm hearing the majority of buyers are outside the, the United States. I'm hearing it can supplement some of the revenue, uh, you know, downward trends in the U.S. You can supplement with export and, and, you know, getting your brand out there first, like Dr. Lai said. So, I mean, these are all really good points and we're glad you're here. We're getting very practical advice, um, which brings me to my next question, uh, Dr. Lai. How did you find your first buyer? <laughs> um, we, first we went foreign to buyer, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, through our website, certainly people just kind of came uh, and they were ordering from the Great Britain and because, you know, we took PayPal and I saw this order come through. I'm like, oh, how do I ship to there? <laughs> so we figured it out. Uh, we used the U.S. Postal Service. It worked out great. Um, it really was pretty easy from a B2C kind of a sales uh, angle. And then as far as B2B sales, uh, working directly with our distribution worldwide, we found ours through going to a trade show. Um, so we went to the International Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, which is one of the uh, biggest for consumer electronics in the world. And uh, we met many, many uh, distributors there. Uh, and I think the, the first one that we signed on was from the UK, in fact. Uh, and. Uh, in fact, we still work with them today. Um, and that would have been what, uh, eight years. So okay. we're, we're still with them. Um, and then um, several others as well. Uh, we met our agent there um, and he helped connect us to other distributors. Got it, thank you very much. Uh, Neil, same question. How did you find your first foreign buyer? It's a, the world's a big place. Well, I mean, did you, did well, you fly somewhere? Did they come over here? What, what does that look like? Well, in the world of COVID, it's hard to believe, but uh, people used to travel and people will begin traveling again. And I can't emphasize enough how important these personal relationships are of getting out into the world of, you know, you know, forgetting about your fears and just going out there and putting yourself out there. You know, so that's what I did. You know, I, 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 I went to uh, Asia and I, and I bought a bunch of tickets. I stayed in hotels. I just went everywhere. I traveled relentlessly. And I got to tell you, not only was it economically very rewarding, but personally rewarding as well. The people that I met, you know, even from years and years ago are still my, my great friends and have been business partners forever. You know, people around the world really appreciate meeting you and sharing ideas and sharing meals together and you know establishing that relationship. I've been at this so long now that I've seen not only the, the, the people I've met originally, but their sons and now their grandchildren have become my customers. And uh, so getting out in the world, uh, meeting people um, is so absolutely important. And I think that's you know, the, to any international business is establishing those personal relationships. And, you know, once, you know, the world opens up and it will open up and it will be soon, you know, we're going to be out there, you know, once again, this is just traveling from, from city to city, place to place, meeting our customers, maintaining those relationships. Great response, Neil. So I'm, what I'm hearing is it's going to be hard to establish a solid relationship with a foreign buyer if you're just, you know, calling or emailing you need to you need to get over absolutely as 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 fun it is, as it is to do these type of meetings that we are now there's nothing nothing that will replace that personal relationship that can only be happening you know, you know being there with them you know and let me tell you going to their countries and being there learning about their cultures that's another thing i did i was just absolutely enamored by learning about their cultures and going there and, and learning their history and so forth and it just made you know them i think admire and respect us something that much more that we took that effort to do that great thank you greg how did you find your first buyer that's a good question. Yeah, you bet. Um, I mean, I think that uh, the, our, our first buyer came to us, foreign buyer came to us just by word of mouth. So the, the first thing was, Eric, that, uh, that we were working with a cryptographic system uh, for the United States Army that handled very sensitive data. 
and the cryptographic information systems of uh, Canada called us up and said, hey, we heard about what you did uh, for these guys. Can you help us work with, uh, with us to get that done? Hmm. And we had actually already talked to several Canadian opportunities before then, but uh, this was the first one that really wanted to put their money where their mouth was at and get going, right? And so that was our first buyer. And um, uh, it was uh, quite, quite uh, an interesting thing working with another foreign gov government. If you remember back then uh, on, in that particular opportunity, um, you didn't need a passport or driver's license or anything to go to Canada. You just walked in, right? And, um, um, and I got on the plane. This was right as they were changing the rules. I got on the plane to go to Canada to, uh, to meet with the Canadian forces. And all I brought was my driver's license with me. I didn't bring a passport with me. And uh, when, I, uh, when I got into the country, I got met with customs in Canada. And they said, you don't have a passport. You can't get in the country. And I said, well, here's my, here's my, my contract from the Canadian forces, can you, here you go. Uh, maybe you call the Canadian forces and tell them you're turning me away. And they called them up and said, oh no, no, you're, you can go straight to the base. We'll, we'll, we'll let you in, so. Wow, great. So good work spreads, not just locally, but globally, as far as referral that's right. sources. So that's, yep. that's, that's great. Uh, my next question is, it kind of coincides with the first foreign buyer. And that is, we've got roughly 200 countries in this world, 195 to be specific, 195 countries in this world. How do you narrow your focus on which, which will be a good market for you, Greg? Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. So, I, I mean, I think that uh, we, we, TSRI, over the last two years have really uh, done a lot of growing. And we've also started doing a lot of focused marketing. And uh, we've been asking ourselves a lot of that question. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is that um, uh, software modernization is, is key to understanding that the only people that are going to really need your services are people who are running what they call big iron or mainframe computers. And that's a very select group of people, usually state governments. Uh, federal governments and, and country, other uh, ex exterior country governments are running these large enterprise mainframe applications. Uh, then you get into you know, your Fortune 100 companies, which uh, started out in the computing industry and are still holding on to that old legacy uh, mainframe, uh, big iron stuff. And so we are primarily focused on large industries in, in Europe. Uh, large industries in in Japan, large industries uh, in uh, you know in Canada, and, um, and and there's really not a lot of need to focus on anything other than that. And then of course uh, government industries in all those countries as well. Got it. Thank you, Greg. Neil, same question. Out of these 195 countries, uh, how how did you come to a conclusion on where to focus? Well, first of all, I love them all. Um, and if there's a product being sold out there and it's one of uh, a product category we're in, we, we, we want to we participate. But, but to be it from a practical uh, uh, point of view, look, American culture is very popular overseas. And I experienced that firsthand within the restaurant and the hotel industry because of the commercial food service equipment that I sell, in the consumer industry because of the consumer appliances that I sell. American products are in demand everywhere and they have a market everywhere. But from practical sense of view, of course you've gotta go where the money is, where the opportunities are, where you have the ease of access. So the free trade agreement countries, countries that America has free trade agreements with, you know, that really levels the playing field. Let's face it, you know, America doesn't have the same access to foreign markets like foreign countries have to our market. There is a lot of barriers in between, and it's very unfair. I mean, in many cases, American products are, are openly discriminated against by foreign governments. So we have to navigate that. So free trade agreements is one way uh, to help us uh, navigate that. Um, having access to foreign markets, you know, the duties, the tariffs, the regulations. Sometimes you're in industries that are heavily regulated. 
So you really got to understand those regulations. Are they going to work against you or do you have access to the, to the, to those markets? But, uh, you know, we, you know, I, a lot of people say, well, you know, what's your favorite place in the world to do business? I, I love them all. They're, they're all great places to do business. I, I love the people. I love the, the, the cultures and, and experiencing all these different parts of the world. But from a practical sense of view, you know, you got to ensure that you can get paid for your product, that, you know, that they have access to the currency that can pay for your product. And you got to ensure that you actually have access to those markets in the most favorable conditions so you're competitive. Great points. Dr. Lai, did these countries come to you or did you go to them? And how did you decide on which to go to? Yeah, there, a lot of that um, free trade agreements is definitely helpful. Uh, and so we certainly received a lot of inquiries uh, and it was very helpful for, uh, for us to have um, you know, people come to us directly. And that's more of a you know, sit back and passive uh, you know, sales kind of a thing. Uh, but from an active point of view, what we wanted to do was to make sure that we were in the countries that we needed to be in. Um, and so we actually compiled a huge list. So we looked at different data. Um, we looked at, you know, coming from the CIA fact book, uh, how many people are in a country? What's their, uh, you know, median income in that country? Uh, do we think they can afford our products? Uh, are there trade barriers, uh, such as tariffs and things like that? Um, and how many people from those countries are looking at our website? Um, and so we could get that from analytics uh, software uh, for our website. And so then we could determine how much interest was in that country. And then we could see, okay, how much do we expect uh, to be able to sell into that country given you know, how much those people make and how many people there are in that country um, and how much interest, how, how much English do they have uh, to be able to, to, uh, to receive our products? Of course, we do have translations as well, but it is helpful to know for sure um, some of those metrics. And, and so you know, if you uh, kind of weight some of these numbers uh, and put it all together, we came up with kind of our top 10 and then our top 20 and just kind of went down the list and said, okay, we need to make sure that we're definitely focusing in Australia, that we've got presence there, et cetera, et cetera. And, and just, you know, that's how we did it. Interesting approach. So you took a really a hard data stance on uh, going to, and these websites are all free to the public, right? The CIA fact book. Yes. You, you can get any data you want on countries and population and GDP and then kind of narrow down to what makes sense. That's, that's a great approach. Very good. Thank you. Um, you know, if, if exporting was easy, everyone would do it, right? Um, people have enough challenges here domestically in the U.S. selling to domestic buyers. So if, if, if it was easy, everyone would do it. So I would like to ask Dr. Lyon, what, what challenges did you encounter uh, in, in deciding to export? What, what, what challenges are they the same as domestic? I mean, what, tell me about that. Yeah, um, so, so in fact, you know, the reason why we're working with Exim Bank uh, was because we did run into some challenges. Um, there were two distributors that we were working with pretty early on and we had already been shipping to them you know we had had you know two or three sales uh in the thousands of dollars range and so we thought everything was good there was good sell through there was good demand uh in their countries and that they were reliable they were paying us on time unfortunately uh that's i don't know if it was a sham or what exactly but um they both two of them decided to stop paying us when they ordered a twenty thousand dollar order Mm. So we were out $40,000, which is, you know, a lot of money. Um, one of them said that, you know, it, it uh, could not clear customs, that they had to, you know, go through all this rigmarole to, to do that. And, and uh, there were problems there. And then the other one said uh, that the sell-through was decreasing and all this stuff, all kinds of excuses. We were not paid. Uh, and so, you know, what could we do? We, we, talk to um, uh, to creditors uh, to see if they could pursue this overseas and you know it's just not enough money apparently for them to really want to spend the money to pursue um, and then we talked to hey you know can we have a lawyer work on this but you know it's two layers of lawyers you got to have one in the US you got to have one over there <laughs> um, and so by the time you got through paying all the lawyers 
it, it just didn't make sense financially. Um, and so it was through those experiences that we, you know, took another look and uh, found, oh, hey, there's this X and bank thing. Uh, we attended a seminar about it and said, okay, let's do it. It makes absolute sense. All of our interests align. They want us to succeed uh, internationally, to sell more internationally. And that's what we want to do. Great. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you found this and I'm glad we were able to help you out on mitigating some of those payment risks. Um, so other than payment challenges, um, Neil, does anything stand out as far as global export challenges? And are they well, a little bit? A, yeah, Go ahead. I mean, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, a bootstrap entrepreneur, every small business working capital is so fundamentally important. And you know, we want to export, you know, it's so important to our economy that we export. The jobs that we create are so absolutely essential uh, for our people. Um, the benefits that we pay because of our exports, just so much good comes out of it. But the fact is, is even though we have these wonderful, very large financial institutions in the United States, they like to think of themselves of being global, our banks of being global, uh, it's counterintuitive, but they're not. You know, once it gets outside of the U.S. border, I'm not going to name names, but pick anyone you would like, any any bank in the United States, they will not finance against foreign receivables. Hmm. Uh, they will not finance against foreign inventory. What does an entrepreneur have? They have inventory and they have receivable. You know, that's how companies are built in the United States. They they borrow against their inventory and receivable. But if you're doing and you can't borrow against your biggest asset, your most important asset, you can't export. So, you know, I think for me, and, and look, today we're over $300 million company, we're over 500 employees, but I started out on the kitchen table. And the reason I became successful is because I found a way to finance my exports by getting the working capital guarantee from the XM Bank because I had relationships with domestic banks. And as long as they had the XM bank guarantee to support my business through my receivables and my inventory, I was able to unlock that asset so that I could continue to invest and grow my business. And look, foreign countries, generally speaking, support their exporters so much more than the US government does. It's really our, our entrepreneurs against the world with the exception of the XM bank. We have the XM Bank. That's the support that we get. And, and I got to tell you, if you're an exporter, establish a relationship with XM. It's so fundamentally important, especially for your working capital. And that is the lifeblood of any successful business. We certainly appreciate the plug, but we even more appreciate that we're able to help you. That's really the role here at the agency is providing financial tools to help our exporters. And I, and I, and, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but you know, for every dollar that that Congress uh, uh, gives the XM Bank to invest, I don't know how many, many, many more dollars come back because of what you do. So it's it's one of the greatest investments that the U.S. taxpayer has is the XM Bank. Thank you so much for that, Neil. Greg, I also noticed that you were a customer of the XM Bank's credit insurance. Can you tell me a little bit how that works? Because your your company is more service related. You're not putting physical products sure. in a container. Yeah, you and bet. So, so, so we, uh, we have short-term comprehensive multi-buyer export credit insurance from you folks. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll stop back for a second and say we ran into, as we, we, we didn't have XM when we first started exporting, and we started running into challenges that XM has helped us solve. And uh, one of those challenges that we had were uh, customers just not willing to pay us after doing the work because of some rules within their company country that we didn't really understand. Um, another one of the challenges that we had was around um, uh, the, uh, the whole idea of currency fluctuation. I sold a job and I sold the job in US dollars or in, in US dollars for me that I thought was a profitable job. But they, the, the, the foreign company would only be willing to pay me in their currency. And by the time I finished the job, that job was now 25% less than I sold it at because uh, the currency fluctuated that much. 
And you wouldn't think a European country that that would have been the case, but it was definitely the case. And, uh, you know, th those kinds of things can really destroy a small business quickly uh, to, to have 25% of your profit taken away uh, when you've only got a 30% profit to start with. Um, so uh, it, as, as far as, uh, you know, uh, providing insurance for the receivables for foreign countries, what that allowed us to do is allowed us to start having our bank, because our bank wouldn't recognize our foreign receivables as income. And with this insurance, our bank was willing to recognize our foreign insurance as our, our foreign receivables as income, which really allowed us to treat our, our, our income as collateral, uh, which was you know, a pretty big deal for us to be able to maintain our financing with the banks that we were doing, uh, our, our, our uh, local banks that we were doing business with. And the other thing it was, it allowed us to issue um, and extend to our clients worldwide um, to extend them credit to help us um, you know, to, to, to do business with them. And those things were huge to allow us to expand our, our overseas market to the point where we were able to do business just as easily as if the, another country company within their country were offering them the same service. And, um, and, and so for that, we are really appreciative. Glad we're able to help. Sounds like you, yourself and, and, and Neil had a similar problem that we see here pretty often here in the U.S., and that's that the foreign receivables, once that product leaves our shore, banks don't like the finance against it. Um, and, and we're certainly appreciative of the, of the fact that our instruments can help you borrow against it, which actually leads to my next question. Um, coronavirus hit. You know, everyone didn't see this coming. Um, and we started seeing a lot of financial impact out there uh, with businesses. Has, has, and I'll just ask this question broadly and won't point it to anybody. Has Exum's products been helpful to you during this, these, these uncertain times during the, the pandemic? And in what way? If anyone does I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll answer. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's working capital. I mean, it's providing us working capital where the commercial banks won't. And, um, you know, especially during the coronavirus, I gotta tell you, you know, banks, everybody got very much spooked by the whole thing. Imagine where we were just a, a year ago with the economy shutting down. So just getting any sort of credit line from any bank for domestic business uh, was nearly impossible. So getting uh, credit for, for foreign transactions would have been unimaginable. It just would not happen. And uh, without XM, that whole export business would completely shut down unless you're a multinational and, you know, you got all the money that you yeah. need. And but for, you know, most exporters in the United States are small businesses and 97 percent of our exporters in the United States are small businesses. They would be completely wiped out um, and especially during coronavirus if they did not have access to the products that you sell. And that's absolutely true. There's there's just no de there's no debate about it. That's great. Thank you so much. So I think we're we're up to uh, a few minutes left. And as a means to ending the panel presentation, uh, I'd like uh, maybe starting with Dr. Lai, then going to Greg, and then to Neil. If you have any advice to companies in attendance today, they're interested in exporting. Maybe they just haven't taken that next step yet. Any departing message of advice? I, I think it's absolutely necessary for American businesses to export. You know, um, it's how we bring in money from overseas and that's how we grow our own economy. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it's, there's an imbalance there because we buy so much from overseas that we really need to be selling overseas. So it, this is part of, you know, this is part of your duty as an American is to create something that, you know, you can sell overseas uh, that, that, you know, people from around the world is going to buy. Um, and um, I think, you know, one tidbit um, just uh, for fun, uh, you know, if, if you are thinking about selling overseas, start also thinking about, um, you know, not just trademarking uh, and protecting your intellectual property overseas, but also buying your URL. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you have a brand or something along those lines, um, you might want to squat on some of those. That, that's Great just point. one of my tips. Very yeah. good point. Thank you. 
Yeah, I would say, uh, uh, Eric, that um, for somebody that was considering doing uh, uh, doing business overseas, that uh, don't use XM, XM uh, uh, as a uh, as a, le a second thought. That start off with them because we learned the hard way that uh, that it's 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 you know it's having that insurance policy in your pocket um, is so rewarding, especially like during the coronavirus. Even though none of our customers defaulted, just the just the the the, the um, peace of mind to know that we're covered no matter what happens is 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 really allows you to go out and do business the way business should be done. Um, one other thing I would say is that uh, Exim is not a a good um, reason to not hire a lawyer. Um, when you get get into these uh, foreign transactions, working with uh, uh, with uh, banks overseas or organizations overseas, you know, you still have to, as uh, uh, Lou said, you got to, you got to get the, or Lai said, you got to get the, uh, um, you know, the lawyers involved, make sure that you have all your legal ducks in a row, because it's not going to help you if you get into a dispute overseas and, and you don't have good representation. Great message. Thanks, Greg. Neil? Can I say that the American dream does not stop at the border? The American dream is open for Americans globally, around the world. Just go for it. It is one of the most rewarding things that you will do for yourself, not only economically, but, but personally and intellectually. Uh, and after all, isn't reaching out into the unknown and conquering your fears, doing something that you never imagined that you would do, isn't that the American way? And isn't this the way that we should build our country? Very strong, very prosperous by engaging in the, with the world and not being fearful of the world. It is so important that we all do this as a nation. Great message, thank you, Neil. And on that note, uh, I think we'll conclude the presentation. So I wanted just to thanks once again, uh, our panel, excellent message, excellent advice. And let's go ahead and open it up to do our live uh, questions.